what we would call this stream of consciousness. All the words and sentences and bits and snatches of songs or whatever that go through the mind. And John Munn called it the mind's song. The mind is singing it to itself all the time. In technical terms, this is verbal fabrication. And that's one of the things you notice as you try to get the mind to settle down with the breath. All these other things come in, sort of background music. One of the reasons we have the chants at the beginning of the, the meditation and that the chants are repeated day after day after day is to put some new material into that mind song. Some better tunes, some better ideas. Otherwise, the mind just goes on in its old cacophonous ways, with lots of dissonance and lots of weird, weird modulations. And so, at the very least, you want to put something new in and make the new part the new normal. Like thoughts of goodwill for all beings. Do that every day, every day after day, until that becomes the new normal for your mind. Because those attitudes of unlimited goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity, those are Brahma attitudes. The attitudes of a being on a very high level. And you would like to bring your mind up to that level, because otherwise you're on the human level which has lots of ups and downs, goodwill and then ill will, then goodwill and then ill will. And we're usually pretty particular about who we feel goodwill for and who we feel ill will for. And the Buddha is training us to try to erase that line so that there is no ill will, or the ill will is seen as something abnormal. And you replace it with something new. And this may sound artificial. But all our thinking is artificial. It is fabrication. So why not fabricate something good? But as you work with goodwill, you find that after a while you can't just spread cotton candy over everything and think that that takes care of the job. You've got to get specific. This particular person in front of you who is being really obstreperous, or this particular person who is doing a lot of harm in the world, you have to have goodwill for those people too. And that's when you have to think about what does goodwill mean? It means may they create the causes for true happiness in their lives, which means further if they're doing unskillful things that they would realize, oh, this is unskillful, I've got to change. And that should be an attitude you should have, be, can have for everybody. Because after all, we'd like to see all the unskillful people in the world stop being unskillful. And work in ways that are conducive to generosity and virtue. And general well-being all around. So you have to consciously learn how to think that thought. Goodwill doesn't mean that you're giving your approval to what people are doing, or that you have to love them. It simply means you don't want to see revenge. You don't want to have revenge on them, or you don't want to see them suffer for their past bad actions. Now, with some people, that's hard. You feel this person has done so much ill in the world, you'd like to see them suffer a little bit, squirm a little bit before they find your happiness. You've got to ask yourself, well, what kind of food is that for the mind? Because we do feed on this, this mind song that we have, all the bits and snatches of things. Some of them just go right past us, and others we grab a little piece and we, we feed on it. And if you find yourself feeding on ill, Ill will, you have to ask yourself, what are you getting out of it? As the Buddha said, if you want to get past something, you have to see it come, you have to see it go. So you can get a sense of why it's coming. But then you also have to look for the allure. Why is it that when something comes, you don't just let it go, you grab onto it? It's part of the mind's song. It's a 
little tune that you hum to yourself over and over and over again. What is there about that that you find so appealing? What's the flavor you get out of it? And be careful here, because the mind will often lie to itself, especially with something like ill will. When we stop to think about it, we don't like the idea that we're generally hoping for people to suffer. So the mind will come up with one excuse for why, but that may not be the real reason. You know it's not the real reason when you compare the allure with the drawbacks. You say, oh, the drawbacks are much greater, and you let go of it for a little bit, but then the mind goes back. It means it's getting a hit of something that it's not admitting to itself. So you have to watch it again and again and again. This means, on the one hand, that you're willing to admit to yourself that, yes, you do have these unskillful thoughts in the mind, and two, you have some unskillful reasons for liking them. This is one of the reasons why we practice concentration in general, is to get away from those ways of feeding so that when you get back to them, you notice, oh, I'm going to return to that. And it's usually in the moment of returning there will be a little bit of something that indicates why you want to go for it. Once you've really found the allure and can see very clear that it's not worth it, then you don't have to tell yourself to let go. You let go automatically. In John Lee's images of a fruit that is thoroughly ripened, you don't have to pick it. It falls from the tree on its own. In fact, all the Johns talk about this, and when the time comes to let go, you don't have to tell the mind to let go. It sees something so thoroughly understands it so thoroughly that it develops the, the, the dispassion, which is the escape. And so the mind just lets go on its own. So as long as you don't see that letting go on its own, it means there's still more work to be done. And as I said, one of the ways of doing this well is to make goodwill and all these other skillful attitudes, the new normal in your mind. So you can see the thoughts of ill will as something abnormal. If you hang around people who are dealing in ill will and all kinds of other things all the time, that seems normal and, and the mind can just fit in with them very easily. It doesn't question anything. You say, this is just the way human beings are. But then you have to realize that the human world is not a place to find happiness. At least in the ordinary way that people live. You want something better. That means you have to tune your mind into a new radio station, the radio station of the Brahmas, the radio station of the, the Noble Ones. Get on their frequency. And on their frequency, the normalcy is goodwill for all, compassion for all, empathetic joy for all, equanimity for all when it's necessary. That's a song in their minds. So learn a new song. Learn new melodies. The melodies that raise the level of the mind. And that's one of the ways in which we train the mind. There are other aspects to the training besides just learning new ways of thinking. But the fact that we do have these new ways of thinking, and they're part of our repertoire now, that helps us to get a better perspective on our old ways of thinking, and to let them go when, they're, when we see that they're not really worth it. Now that's an important part of discernment right there. 